my hope is that when I get up here, I actually end up doing what I say in the music I'm going to do, because I want you to try to hear the difference. But that's hard, because there's a lot of minute detail between the ornaments. So don't, be, don't feel bad if, you know, I, I wrote that I was going to do this kind of more from the first time, than, and this different the second time, and it, and it was hard to distinguish. The, again, the overall goal of what we're trying to do here is to give a better performance. So let's go now to, I want to try to give you much of the basics of French Baroque playing as possible. So let's dive right in. Uh, rhythmic inégalité, which means we don't play the rhythms metrically the way we see them on the page. So starting with even eighth notes, right? We don't play even eighth notes. Like in the Allemand and the Gavotte and the Menuet, probably the first bit, correct? Mm -hmm. So any movement that you play in French Baroque music, um, the moving notes, if they're in stepwise motion, meaning a scale pattern, we're going to go ahead and play them unequal. It's not something that was done sometimes, it was done a lot, all the time. The default was not even eight notes. I'm sorry, not even moving notes. The default was uneven moving notes. When it's in stepwise motion. And the moving notes, well again, like the Allemand and the Gavotte and the Menuet, the move, our moving notes there are definitely the eighth notes. So whatever movement you're playing, in general, your smallest note value is going to be the moving note that you play unequally Long, short, long, short, long, short, long, kind of a lazy, not long, short, long, short, long, short, long, right? Kind of a lazy, long, short, long, <coughs> your smallest note value. They, we think it uh, originated with the French language, so who does it the most in the Baroque? The French. <coughs> the inequality of the two notes. So we're talking about a group of four notes. One, two, three, five, yeah, da, 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 da. Note number one and three being the long one, note number uh, two and four being the short one. The inequality of, of notes with the French, it's more of a length thing. Now when you go to play German and Italian music, you're not going to do your inequality so much with length. Okay, so uh, I know we're going to talk about French Baroque, but let's do it in the context of, I'll give you a few comparisons. When you do your German, when you do Bach, or your Italian Baroque, you're going to make your notes <coughs> equal more with weight and volume. Okay, weight and volume. Now, I find that more difficult to do, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you're going to try to make moving notes unequal, it's much, I find it much easier to get, kind of swing them, which is a length thing, like okay. that. So again, in some, just, um, just rule of thumb, French music, you're going to make your notes unequal with length. German and Baroque, the German and Italian Baroque music, you're going to make your moving notes, your scale pattern moving notes, uh, unequal more with weight and volume. And it really could go all the way up to what sounds to us like a dotted, uh, two eighth notes actually being played totally dotted. It just depends on the nature of the piece. Like um, uh, the beginning of a box French suite. Well, here we are already referencing box, but that's a French piece. So that's a good that's the best example of So a piece with dotted rhythm like that. So it just depends on the tempo. In general, the faster the tempo, the less you're gonna be able to do unequal. So today in our rondo that was 3-8, you know, John and I were kind of cooking on it. We really couldn't swing the, the 16th as much there as we could in some of the other pieces like swinging and moving, moving notes. Okay, so another generalization. How much, how much do I do? The slower the tempo, the, the more uneven and uneven. Okay? Be it French, German, or Italian, French or German, or German. The, more, the faster, it's just a law of physics. You're just not going to be able to do it. Okay? Uh, does that all make sense? Is that kind of good, clear rule of thumb? When do we not do it? I love these exceptions. <laughs> My favorite one. Do you see that example?
example by, um, well, first of all, we don't do it on repeated notes. We don't do it on repeated notes. So if, if you have a passage where there's like four equal eighth notes all on an E, you don't do it on repeated notes. Never. It doesn't matter what country the French Baroque composer came from. Never on repeated notes. You don't do it on arpeggio. So that's why in major 81 of the rondo, I wrote E flat. It's a very important distinction. So we, the inadol was only a scale thing. It was only a step by motion thing. Never do it on broken patterns or arpeggios. Thus, in one movement, in one piece, you're going to end up playing inadol for a while and then not inadol here. Does that make sense? Never on arpeggios. Dots over notes. Guess what? So I really believe that in variation 10, if you play from a good edition of the Marie Marie Le Folies, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, there's dots over the notes. I think that's Marie telling us, please don't play this movement in the gall, because that variation 10, there's a lot of scale patterns, stepwise motion. In the early works, especially, dots over notes were the composer telling the performer, please do not play in a golf. Do not play unequal. Play these notes equal. So, my point is, question the dot over a note when you're playing Baroque music. We're conditioned to think that a dot over a note always means staccato. Especially in the first part of the Baroque, the dot over the <coughs> note may very well mean they're simply telling you to please play these notes metrically evenly. It has nothing to do with articulation. Now, when I first started reading that in multiple treatises, that just blew my mind, right? Because we're still coming out of our, you know, 20th century, you know, band pedagogy, and, you know, <laughs> dot over note means staccato, not in the Baroque. Now, by the end of the Baroque, composers were using the dot as well as its predecessor, that thing that looks like a carrot, tiny little carrot, that's on another example we have coming up. So by the end of the Baroque, both that little tiny carrot, that slash, that, that, um, that vertical stroke, mm -hmm. and the dot. They both do mean staccato, but, but only about the late Baroque. So when you're playing an early Baroque, just look at your, if you see a dot over in the note, look up the date real quick of your composer, look at, the, look at the passage. If the dots are over uh, notes in a scale pattern, stepwise motion, that composer may not be, that Baroque composer may not be telling you to play these notes staccato. He may be telling you to play the notes easily. Maybe he wants some legato. Right? Or she? Uh, last, so these are the exceptions. Again, it, it doesn't matter if it's a scale-wise scale -wise pattern. Uh, it has dots over it. And <coughs> look at that little clip by Glave. When there's long slurs. That's because long slurs were pretty rare. We don't see long slurs written in music a lot by Baroque composers of any nationality. And I talk about we're really talking about the big three, French, German, Italian, when we're talking about flute music. So when there are long slurs over a note, and this passage by Blavé is clearly, basically stepwise motion. Yeah, we've got a third here and there, but this is what I would call roughly stepwise motion. Had Blavé not put those slurs in, com uh, performers would have, would have played those notes unequal. Okay, so when you see long slurs over the notes, it, there's a good chance no, there's no guarantee is there. There's nothing really good stuff. But there's a good chance that the composer's telling you, please play these notes equally. Okay? Um, and this is, so these, this note in the unequal notes is why we overdot our dotted rhythms. Overdotting our dotted rhythms. So I've heard a lecture recently once. Um, she said, uh, this is a, a music professor at Stanford and Mills College in California. She said, in the Baroque, they really, the dot after a note, so I can say a quarter, dotted quarter note or a dotted eighth note, a dot after a note, to their, to their minds, did not mean half the value of the note to which it's attached. Mm -hmm. They did not. If you went back in time and said that, then she said, and, and this, this supports more or less what I'm reading in other treatises. But the dot after the note to a Baroque composer simply meant play that note longer than an eighth note. Play this note longer than a quarter note. So we have to totally get our minds out of the whole metric value thing of 
dotted quarter eighth note that means that dotted quarter is exactly three eighth notes long and the eighth note exactly an eighth note. We have to totally get that out of the mindset. The dot simply me means it's a longer note and the note after it is a very fast note. And we just have to use our good taste. <coughs> Generalization, a small note after a dotted note, an eighth note after a dotted quarter note, a sixteenth note after a dotted eighth note, and so on and so forth. We're going to play them even later than what we assign their metric value. Okay? So in general, we always play them a little bit later. So always, uh, 90, I shouldn't say not always, 95% of the time. Play that little note after the dotted rhythm a little bit later. But there's an exception, and it's a great one. There's a little uh, excerpt there by Blavé where this is a flute duet. And you see in major two, where flute one has, an eight, has a 16th note pickup, flute one needs to align with the triplets in the other voice. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to do the exact opposite. So when you have a dotted rhythm in your solo voice, and in the accompaniment, if there are triplets, you do the opposite. You go the opposite way. You make your, your dotted rhythm triplet-like. Does that make sense? Yes. That, that blows my mind yes. when I first started reading that. Now, that, that, that one, that the, whenever there are triplets, we do the total exact opposite. There is a Handel sonata, one of his sonatas. Same exact thing. Look, the, you'll, you'll find it. It's a the, the flute has all these dotted rhythms, and then below the piano part in the right hand is all is triplets. Well, there mm -hmm. we don't over dot. We we line up. We we kind of lazy our dotted rhythms into triplets. So a big exception. Mm -hmm. Um, does that give you an idea about rhythmic goofiness? Okay. Mm -hmm. What you see on the page is not as it appears. And I love that quote that I put. That's why I put it there. By by Cook Wrong. He says, in my opinion, our musical notation contains mistakes because what we, what we write differs from what we play. Mm. It's, a, it's like they were, they, in their own time, they were writing contemporary music. Mm. Well, we're writing, they felt constrained by their musical notation. Well, every time my trio, Black Cedar, every time we commission a piece, every, the, every our composer feels like they have to give us their own little chart about how to read their notation. So, <laughs> Today, contemporary composers feel constrained by the musical notation system. And in 1716, Couperon felt constrained by the musical notation system. So what we see on the page is not as it appears. So we, but luckily, they wrote a lot about music. They didn't record anything, but they wrote a lot about it. So <laughs> going through and reading it all, I'm trying to give you a condensed version. There's your list of time signatures that you'll see in the French Baroque. See that big two and that big three? Isn't that neat how you saw in the, the sheet music, the Alamon, that big two doesn't stand for cup time. It's not a shorthand for cup time. Mm -hmm. And that big three, it's just, it's just the French thing. They just do that. And I kind of arranged them just to give you an idea of which movement is faster, how, roughly what's fast and what's not so fast. Um, that's all pretty clear. Um, I hope I, I don't know if you're copied, there should be a break between the keep this time signature 3-8 and 6-4. Yeah. Okay, good. So 3-8 is the fastest of the three. And you're, a lot of times you're not going to end up doing anything underneath your hair. Especially if your composer tells you to play press release.